Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Highland Branch Royal Aeronautical Society webinar on Space Hub Sutherland, the journey to create the world's greenest spaceport. My name is Kirsty, and on behalf of the Highland Branch Committee, I'm pleased to welcome society members, friends of the branch, and also those joining us for the first time. We are really interested to know where people are joining us from tonight, so please use the Q&A tab to say hello and tell us where you are from. Throughout tonight's presentation, I invite you to ask questions using this Q&A tab and to vote in support of questions which others have already posted. We are pleased to welcome two very distinguished speakers tonight, Mr. David Oxley, the Director of Strategic Projects for Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and Mr. Howard Nye, the President of the Royal Aeronautical Society and Chairman of the Space Specialist Group. David will deliver the main presentation, which will then be followed by discussion with Howard, after this discussion, there will be an opportunity for Howard and David to answer any of your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Howard Nye and invite him to introduce the topic and our guest speaker. Thank you very much, Kirsty, and thank you very much for the invitation to uh, help support this event. Uh, the Launch UK initiative was announced in 2017 by Joe Johnson, the brother of the Prime Minister, that he was then the Minister of State for University Science Research and Innovation. The aim at the time was to be the first country in Europe to offer small satellite manufacturers a direct end-to-end -end route to launch, building on our leading small satellite industry. In other words, to host new commercial spaceflight activities in a safe and responsible way, to bring new jobs and economic benefits to communities and organisations eager to be part of the rapidly growing UK space sector and to enable UK and international scientists and space tourists to harness the unique environment of space. The UK's geographical location allows both horizontal launch by aircraft carrying small launch vehicles and or suborbital space tourist flights, for example, from Cornwall, and vertical launch specifically from the north of Scotland to access a range of valuable polar and sun synchronous orbits. The UK Space Industry Act in 2018 was the first major step towards establishment of the necessary regulatory framework to enable launches to take place from the UK. The much more detailed secondly, secondary legislation, totaling about 900 pages, was very recently approved by Parliament and it puts in place the legal and regulatory framework that will facilitate commercial spaceflight launches from the UK. And this is indeed a substantial achievement, giving the UK the most modern piece of spaceflight legislation in the world. And unlike NASA or French leg legislation, it's designed with the commercial market in mind from the outset. In addition, the CAA, nominated as the regulator for the UK space flight, is ready and waiting to process license applications for satellite launch with immediate effect. So this is why we are very interested in the progress and the state of uh, work on um, Space Hub Sutherland. So our speaker this evening, David Oxley, is the Director of Strategic Projects at Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and he will be giving us insight into the progress being made at and for Space Hub Sutherland. David has worked on economic development for 17 years, a qualified accountant. He moved to the Highlands in 2004, following a career in the food and drink sector. Since 2017, David has been Senior Responsible Officer for Space Hub Sutherland. And today, as Director of Strategic Projects, he has overall responsibility for the development of the space sector across the whole region, including but not limited to Sutherland. So now, David, after that short introduction, uh, introduction, the floor is yours. Thank you, Howard. Uh, thank you for those, that introduction. Uh, so delighted to be here this evening, uh, virtual though it is, to uh, speak to you all about the uh, development of Space Hub Sutherland. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about HI and what we do. Uh, HI is how we say HI for Highlands Islands Enterprises shorthand. You will find quite a few abbreviations uh, in all of this, um, but that is, you know, I'm, I'm told that uh, the aerospace sector has quite a few short acronyms itself. So hopefully that will 
be okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about high, a little bit about um, the launch sector and the market that we're, we're looking at. Why Scotland for launch and in particular why Sutherland? Um, and then I've got a nice video lined up. It's always good to see um, what the site will look like in the future. Uh, and then I will focus on the green credentials of ha of the Space Hub Sutherland project uh, and give a, a vision for the next decade or so for the region in terms of space. Um, so uh, that is that's what I plan to do. So I'll kick off uh, with just a, an introduction to what Highlands Arthur Enterprise is. We are the Economic and Community Development Agency for the North of Scotland. Uh, we've been around for quite a long time, 55 years now. We established 56 years, established in 1965. Uh, and our purpose is to really get more folks actively contributing to the uh, economy of the region, living, working, studying, investing, and importantly, visiting. Uh, and we have priorities around communities, business, and increasingly green recovery. Uh, it's important to know it's economic and community development. Up until about a couple of years ago, we were pretty unique in the world in having that remit. And that goes to the, the fact that um, creating businesses is great, but creating thriving communities in a sparsely populated part of the world is equally important. OK, so just to, I'm sure many of you as Highlands and Islands residents will know a bit little bit about the geography of the region. Um, but that, that's pretty much the area we cover uh, from Shetland in the north down to Argyll in the south, from the West Niles across to Murray, where I'm broadcasting from today. Uh, and it is a fairly remote area. It's, uh, it's uh, significant in the most proportion of people that live on islands uh, and also the, the relatively small number that live in a large settlement like an Inverness or an Elgin. Uh, and we have a term within economic development of fragile areas and basically those are the areas which are furthest away from centers of population and that is particularly uh, the uh, more remote islands and the fringes of the west and north coast of uh, Scotland where you find very few people and limited job opportunities and one of our key challenges is to try and improve all of that. So um, just a few stats on, on population. This becomes in part important for why we're doing this. So there's less than half a million people live in, uh, live in the Highlands and Islands. And to put that into perspective, uh, you can tell I'm not a Highlander by my accent. I come from County Durham originally. Uh, County Durham is a relatively small county in the north of it, northeast of England, and it has about the same population as the Highlands and Islands. Uh, uh, in the Highlands and Islands, we have um, a, a aging population, uh, a lot of people over 50 and in the more remote areas this is uh, this is even more apparent uh, and we have a sparsity of population in the areas in some areas as well. Um, we actually do quite well in terms of employment. Uh, we do we have more people as a percentage of population employed than the rest of Scotland. Uh, we have a typically we have um, a lot of folks self-employed uh, and our unemployment rate is generally uh, lower than it has been in the rest of Scotland. Uh, that, that's taken a little bit of an impact because of COVID. Uh, tourism is a dominant sector in the region and clearly the tourism sector over the last 18 months has not had a particularly good time. Uh, we do expect that the population will grow over the next uh, 20 years or so, uh, but it isn't growing evenly. And what we anticipate is big growths in areas where significant populations like Inverness uh, and parts of Murray, but uh, less growth and in fact even contraction in population in uh, some of the more remote areas. Uh, and the final bit on that slide is just the graphic with the heads on there. What's that trying to say is that back in 1981, for every, um, every person in retirement, there were four people working. Uh, if we roll forward 20 years from now, there'll be less than two. Uh, so that has a significant impact on the ability of a community or, a, or an area to sustain itself. So these are some of the challenges we're trying to address as Highlands and Isles Enterprise. Um, so some of these uh, challenges uh, you're well aware of and I've covered some of those. Uh, a few things I'd just like to highlight amongst that. Um, youth out migration is a real uh, challenge for us. Uh, we, we have universities in the region, University of the Highlands Islands being the main one, 
uh, but we have others in various parts of uh, the region. But uh, we do find that uh, many of our young people disappear off to uh, the central belt and to Aberdeen and other parts of Scotland and the UK for uh, higher education opportunities and that impacts on uh, the, the population that's left behind. So solving youth migration is a really important aspect for us and what better than space to attract folks to young people to, to live and work in the region. Although we have a lot of employment, low incomes are a challenge driven typically by the, the sectors that are dominant in the region. So again, an opportunity for space to, to deliver that. So uh, I hope that's a little bit, you understand a little bit more about Highlands as Enterprises as an organisation. I just want to talk a little bit about the market for launch. Uh, and we've done quite a bit of work on this with uh, a company called Space Tech Partners, who are pretty much experts in the field in terms of looking at the space sector. Uh, and the report is available on the website there. Uh, I've given the long name, but if you go into the hie.co.uk and just Google and just type in space into the search bar, you will find the, the, the full report in there. And basically the, the outcome of that report has been a uh, significant and growing opportunity for the UK and Scotland in terms of launch capacity over the next decade. So this slide is a, a slide that Space Tech prepared for us and that's just showing over the last decade or so we've seen pretty much on average 10% per annum growth in terms of the number of operational satellites there are around the world. So there's approaching 3000 satellites uh, in orbit at the moment. Vast majority of those are looking at communications and Earth observation, two really important aspects which uh, are, are uh, important for the uh, the development of further space opportunities in there. So the market's been growing pretty well over the last uh, decade or so. Next slide, please. Uh, and what that the bulk of those opportunity the bulk of those satellites that are in orbit are actually small satellites and this is the market that um that space of sutherland and the other spaceports in the region are really focused on and that's typically uh, satellites under 500 kilogram uh, and the vast majority of those are commercial and the small sites satellites in particular uh, 70 percent of the satellites that are up there are commercial satellites and a very relatively small uh, element of uh, military satellites. Um, so it's really important to understand that. So if we've got 3000 or so satellites in the air at the moment, uh, where do we expect that to be over the next uh, decade or so? So uh, Space Tech did a lot of analysis for this and came back with three, three scenarios, a high, medium and low, which showed significant uh, forecasts of growth. And that's been driven by this the demand for satellites uh, across the world really. Uh, so there is the market for up to approaching 20,000 satellites to be in orbit um, within the next decade. So you can see that is a significant increase and uh, there's a real opportunity there for Scotland, the UK to, to, to gain a big slice of that market. Um, so in terms of space, uh, this is a really important sector for the UK. Uh, we all know we're in hopefully coming out of the end of a, a pandemic uh, and that has impacted the economy pretty negatively in, in, in lots of areas. Space is, is a growth sector and we anticipate there will be a real opportunity for significant growth in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, this UK space has ambitions to grow to 10% of the global market. Uh, and Scotland has an ambitions to get to 10% of that UK market. So there's a real opportunity there. And it's not just about um, spaceports and launch, it's about the opportunities that will deliver across the supply chain from manufacturers of satellites and launch vehicles as, as well as the, the wider su supply chain. The, a few facts there, as a, as a nation in Scotland, actually in Glasgow, we produce more sat small satellites than anywhere else in Europe. Uh, and we also are in, in Scotland are home to two uh, companies that are leading in terms of design and manufacture of launch vehicles. Uh, Orbex in Forest where I'm broadcasting from and Skyrora in Edinburgh. 
uh, and we have to recognize that this is all this demand is really what we're doing today. We wouldn't be able to do the things we're doing today. We wouldn't be able to do this talk with you without the use of satellites uh, from smartphone phones to GPS devices, all sorts of things absolutely rely on data and technology and that is only going to grow. So the space sector is really, really growing. Uh, we're not there, we're not absolutely not at the limit of it yet. And the UK and Scotland has ambition to, to, to be significant players in that market. So what does this mean for the Highlands and Islands? I, I often talk about when I'm asked to do talks like this about launch being the, the missing piece of the jigsaw. So as I've mentioned, Scotland has a great, great reputation and capacity in terms of satellite manufacture. We're getting that, we're, we're getting that uh, reputation as well in launch vehicle development. And we have uh, experts across uh, in and al analyzing all that data that comes from it. So if you think about the supply chain from launch to vehicle to satellite to anal analyze the data, we've got three out of the four pieces already in Scotland. Uh, the missing piece of that jigsaw is is spaceports and a launch facility or launch facilities. Um, so we we do believe that is that is where we can get to um, the market research that we are we are expecting to to get to is showing an average of over 50 launches per annum across the next decade and that grows over time. And why Scotland? Well, it's in some ways it's it's relatively simple. We have great access to the northerly orbits that we need, uh, both polar and sun synchronous, as I would mention briefly early, earlier. We have accessible locations. Uh, we have a supply chain that is highly skilled, whether it's in aerospace or in general engineering through oil and gas and renewable energy that can be uh, readily switch over to a, a sector like space. Um, and Scotland really has a thriving space sector. Uh, we have full support from UK and Scottish government. The programme for government that was announced yesterday by uh, the First Minister specifically mentioned space as an opportunity and uh, looking for launch by 2023 from Scotland. So it's right up there and and uh, full front for, for this. And I, actually, when I was just looking about an hour ago before I came on to this call, I didn't notice that somebody on the BBC stolen my thunder because there's a, a a good article on the BBC about green spaceports and uh, all of that. So I'm sure if some of you will be able to have a look at that uh, later on. So it's it really is a, a great opportunity for for the region. So um, simple question. Uh, why? How does a small satellite manufacturer get into orbit? Well, if you are a small satellite manufacturer at the moment, you basically um, haven't got full control of when your satellite gets launched. The the likelihood is that you're going to have to go on what is termed ride share, which is where a big vehicle with a big satellite on will launch their satellite, and it uh, you will get space around it in the in the launch vehicle to 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 go up. Now that puts you not really in control of anything. Um, you these launches tend to be in fairly remote and inaccessible areas. Typically Kazakhstan is a, is a major uh, a major spot. Um, if for whatever reason the big satellite isn't ready, then you miss that you miss the bus. Uh, the bus goes without you. Uh, if um, and everything is driven by the needs of the big satellite, they're take they're paying the bulk of the money. You've got to go with what they want. So it's like getting on a bus. Um, you might get to where you want to go, but you're probably not going to get to exactly where you want to go. And you're going to have to go to the timetable that the bus wants you to go to, not what you want to go to. So the future um, and really the market that the spaceports in the UK in terms of vertical launcher targeting is um, really more of a taxi or an Uber service. So you are it's small satellites on small launch vehicles that can go up to the right orbit for your particular satellite and it goes at the time and the destination that you want. Now obviously there might be a slight price differential in, in that, but you get to control where you go and uh, that's a really important aspect of, of all of this. So I'll talk mainly today about Space Up Sutherland, but it's worth mentioning and I'm, I can't quite see who else is on the call, but there may be uh, others on the call who know more about uh, the other spaceports because uh, there are a number of um, ex-aerospace uh, folk involved 
in in spaceports around the region, but we have actually four potential vertical launch, sorry, three three potential vertical launch spaceports in the region. Uh, Space of Sutherland, uh, Saxavord Spaceport in Shetland on, on Unst, uh, and Spaceport One in the Western Isles, as well as a potential uh, horizontal launch from Makrahanish, former RAF, RAF base in Campbelltown in Argyle. And we're working closely with all of these spaceports to try and help them move forward and develop the economic opportunity. And it really is an economic opportunity for for many of these spaceports. They're all at different stages in their progress, but they've all got the opportunity to to make a big difference to their economy. And as you can see from that map, they're all in pretty remote areas. There are other spaceports planned in, in the rest of the UK, uh, but I'm just focusing on the Scottish stuff. Um, so. As I've said, launch is important and it's uh, it's really the missing piece of the jigsaw, but it's not everything. And I think what we are trying to to get across today is this is a uh, launch being the missing piece in the jigsaw will have a catalytic effect on the sector. Launch is not really a big part of the space economy per se. Most of that is in the downstream as aspects of data and analysis and satellite manufacture, etc. But we can actually see a space hub developing around a spaceport because if you are a spaceport the chances are you're going to have your launch vehicle manufacturer wanting to be relatively close to you potentially in the highlands and islands in scotland the supply chain impact of what they need as as manufacturers is important uh, and that will will come through uh, and all of that is is absolutely vital to the growth of the sector. We anticipate that there will be upstream, mid, midstream and downstream impact to this. So launches and, and spaceports in themselves are really important for the areas they develop, but they're almost more important as the catalytic impact on the sector uh, across Scotland and the UK. So just to give you a quick example of that, I'm sure some of you have come across Orbex. Orbex have been our partner on this project for uh, several years now, I think four or five years at least. Uh, they've established their base in Forest uh, and uh, are into their first factory, uh, and that will be the mission control and manufacturing of their prime launch vehicle. Uh, that bottom right hand corner there is a picture of their launch vehicle. I'm keeping Howard happy by not saying the R word. He knows what I mean by that. Um, so Orbex have grown to around 100 staff. Uh, next month, they'll be moving into their second factory, also in the Enterprise Park in Forest. Uh, in fact, it's not next month, it's next week. Uh, and they plan to develop even further manufacturing capacity on the on the um, Enterprise Park in Forest. They're also very well connected into RAF Kinloss. Sorry, that's showed my history there. Kinloss Barracks in terms of uh, test facilities there for for uh, for uh, some of the uh, vehicles as well. And we expect them generally to, to be deploying several hundred feet forks by within the next decade. And they have been working, say, with us since 2017. Sutherland is their home spaceport. So a little bit about uh, the journey so far. Uh, and it has been a, quite a journey. Uh, it's probably been the most complicated and challenging project I've ever worked on and probably ever will, uh, but it's also been the most interesting and exciting project I've ever ever worked on. So we go back to 2017. Uh, UK Space Agency uh, announced a a competition for uh, applicants to develop a launch capability. Uh, we put in a number of bids, one with Lockheed Martin, and one with Orbex, uh, and those applications went in 2017. In 2018, at Farnborough. Uh, UK Space Age announced two and a half million pounds of funding towards the Space Hub Sutherland project alongside funding for Orbex for their development and funding for Lockheed Martin for their development. Uh, since then time, 2019 was really the year of environmental studies and I'll come onto this in a bit more detail, but we have spent a huge amount of time studying the environment uh, that we have in and around Sutherland. It's a very uh, important and vital uh, and unique environment and we're taking very serious care in what we do at that particular site. In 2020, that was the year of planning. Uh, so the planning application went in in February 2020 and we all know what happened in March 2020. 
so it took us a little while to get our planning application approved. That took us till August uh, and we were successful in that. Uh, and we then uh, applied to the land court. The land court is a slightly uh, strange thing to be thinking about when we you talk about spaceport development. You wouldn't think it normally comes into it, but the other key partner on this project is the Melness Crofters Estate who own the land on which the, the spaceport will be developed. And that is crofting land uh, and any changes to crofting land need to go through the land court and make sure that the land court are happy with what. So we knew we were going to have to go through the land court. We're currently in the midst of that and anticipating a decision on that any t any any day now. Uh, in 2020, uh, Lockheed Martin moved towards Shetland as their preferred uh, site for location for uh, Pathfinder launch for UK and uh, that was largely down to vehicle size. Uh, Shetland is a, a spaceport which is uh, aiming at slightly bigger launch vehicles than than Sutherland is and Lockheed Martin, uh, their vehicle was becoming too big for Sutherland in, in many respects. So we were very comfortable with Lockheed Martin moving to Shetland and uh, they're working closely with um, the owners of Shetland Saks Award Spaceport. Uh, so this year has been uh, quite a little, quite a little work on legal stuff. Uh, we have a judicial review against the spaceport. Uh, that that judicial review decided just a few weeks ago in favour of of uh, Sutherland, and uh, we are now really in the depth of detailed design of the the plans. So where do the sockets go? Uh, all of that sort of real minutiae of detail that we'll need to work through. Next steps beyond this are construction and intention of aiming for first launch by the end of 2022. So a little bit of geography there in terms of uh, where the site is. I think most of you will probably know a little bit about the geography of the, the highlands and islands. So it's that uh, piece of uh, Sutherland just uh, right on the north coast right on the north coast 500 uh, that actually passes by uh, the proposed site of the spaceport and uh, what you're seeing on the right hand side are the the infrastructure that we are developing the area that's shaded in orange there is the areas that are the uh, environmentally sensitive areas so the sites of special scientific interest etc and you can see We've very carefully designed the spaceport so it does not interfere with these important areas. So at the bottom of the screen there, you've got the Launch Operations Control Center, uh, which is where the, the, the main uh, facility works. Uh, you then go along a, a road for, which is a, a road in the sense of a wind farm type road, not a concrete or tarmac road, uh, to what we're calling the Launch Site Integration Facility, the LSIF. Uh, and that is where the launch vehicle is is held uh, and then moves out to the launch pad uh, before on, on launch day. We're now going to go on to a short video which will go through this in a bit more detail and hopefully that will enable you to get a better idea of the landscape and uh, how the how the site will develop. So on this this piece of the video, we the building you see in the center of the screen there is the the lock, the launch cent operations uh, control center. As you can see, it's designed so that from the road you don't actually see that much of it. It blends into the background. Uh, the the little um, tarmac piece to the to the sort of center of the screen at the moment is the uh, power plant for the site. We're looking south here towards uh, Ben Hope and Ben Loyal, uh, and we've studied this site in huge uh, detail. You'll see as you go as the, as the uh, video goes on that there are various cuttings uh, of into the site. So those straight lines that you see in the ground uh, are actually where crofters have cut peat uh, over the centuries if not, decades if not centuries uh, to use as fuel 
for themselves. Now, part of our restoration plan is to fill in all of those. Now we're moving up towards the, the launch pad uh, here. Uh, and that's where we are uh, anticipating. Get some idea of the scale of this. It's the uh, size of the OBEX Prime vehicle is about 90 meters. Uh, so it is, I'm constantly having to say to folks that this is not Cape Canaveral that we're building here. This is a small bespoke boutique almost spaceport that is suitable for for the uh, the, the area in which it uh, it sits. OK, so I hope that's given you a bit of an overview of what the site uh, will look like. As you can see, it's been really developed to, to complement the environment in which it sits and complement uh, everything around it. If we can go back to the presentation now. And just on a couple of slides, I think, uh, Dave. Back one. There we go. Um, so just a, a few more in detailed photos uh, there. So these these aren't photos. Some of them are mock-ups uh, of what what we would expect. So you can see on the top left there that is um, what we the the operations control center. So lots of folks doing very technical stuff on launch uh, uh, around there. Top right is the uh, launch. The ELSIF, the uh, launch site integration facility. So that's where the launch vehicle comes in uh, onto that, into that, is prepared for launch in that building and then is moved out uh, along the bottom right picture towards the launch pad. Bottom left picture is uh, the ground investigation work that we undertook a few months ago uh, to make sure just to check the, the environmental conditions on the uh, depth of peat being a particularly important one to help us in the design as we move forward. So in terms of launch, uh, I think Howard mentioned it right at the start, the regulations are now in place and the Civil Aviation Authority is the regulator. Applications for licenses will be made later this year. Uh, and in terms uh, of Sutherland, we expect first launch in around 18 months or so, and we're targeting around 12 launches per annum, which is what we are allowed to do with our planning restrictions. And absolutely, it's at the bottom, but it's actually the most important thing. Safety will be paramount in all of all of the things that we do on site. So uh, spaceports and green, uh, perhaps a phrase that most folks won't think goes well together. Uh, but we do aim for Space of Sutherland to be the uh, greenest spaceport in the world. A few pictures are there of the types of wildlife we do have in the area. Uh, and we, we have done uh, 30 odd studies on the environmental aspect, looking at flora and fauna and vegetation and all sorts of things. I think our assessment was over a thousand pages in terms of the environment. So we we've studied it. We pretty know, know the birds by name up there. Uh, so we have been really looking at this site for a long time. And we've worked very closely with the uh, environmental agencies in Scotland, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, SEPA, and Nature Scott, the new name for, for Scottish National Heritage. Uh, and as part of our planning conditions, we will have to manage the habitats of the site 
throughout its life and that is absolutely the most important thing it's worth just a point i just want to re-emphasize here on the greenness is that we've got to remember what satellites are used for and a huge amount of them are used for earth observation and monitoring how the how the planet is is operating how uh ice ice shelves are, are crumbling what how what disasters are happening and how they how they're impacting our stuff and we, if we didn't have satellites we wouldn't know this information and we wouldn't be able to do things to change things so in terms of our ambition to be the uh, greenest spaceport in in the world uh, we will have effective management plans in for bird life and water courses and particularly peat now those areas in uh, dark green and purple on the map on the right hand side there are the the existing cuttings of peat and you can see they're quite substantial there's a lot of peat being cut by the local community over the decades and centuries and we anticipate that we will uh, be able to use all of the peat we extract in move in developing the site and use it to uh, fill in all of the uh, channels that are out there at the moment uh, this looks like a pristine peat bog when you go up there it's not a pristine peat bog there is and if you don't manage the peat the peat doesn't do the job it's meant to do in terms of carbon capture so a real important aspect for us is actually helping by developing a spaceport we can actually manage the peat better on site as a result of that and actually contribute towards uh, improvements in carbon management Uh, another important aspect is uh, our key partner, Orbex. Uh, Orbex are, are quite revolutionary in some of their thinking as a, as a company. Uh, their launch fuel is not the typical uh, rocket fuel. It's uh, biopropane, so biopropane produced by bio means. Uh, in terms of carbon emissions, it's 10% of the carbon emissions of a typical kerosene based rocket fuel uh, and has no carbon particulates. So they've got a really strong fuel uh, in impact in terms of uh, what they're doing. So compare Orbex to any other launcher that's not using biopropane. Orbex are going to be much better further ahead in terms of their green credentials. As I mentioned, we have a habitat uh, management plan which we uh, will will put in. Um, also worth mentioning for Orbex that their vehicle is intended to be reusable. Um, so they will uh, capture uh, stages of the launch vehicle uh, when they land in the sea and will reuse them in future launches. So again, trying to get into that uh, real recycling, reuse, renew uh, environment. So um, where are we at at the moment? Um, well, we're in the middle of finalizing design and satisfying the planning conditions, and there are quite a few planning conditions, but we're working through all of those. Uh, we intend to uh, develop an a relationship with a, a launch site operator. In simple terms, that means it's not me pressing the big red button on launch day, it's somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, so we, are, we will be uh, progressing that, that part of the project over the next while. Construction starts uh, hopefully in the next few months and then we will be on to a sustainable launch uh, program. And as I said, well, it's not just about launch, it's about the cluster development. Uh, there's a, already a space cluster being established uh, up in the region uh, based around uh, Thurso and Wick, uh, and that is a steering group of lots of folks involved with that so we've got ourselves highlands Arms enterprise the highland council murray council the space agency scottish government satellite applications catalog catapult the university um chamber of commerce and many many others so pretty much we are getting behind this as a real opportunity to grow grow launch capability but also the wider sector from across the region And final slide from me, and then I'm sure I'll be hopefully there'll be plenty of questions uh, on all of this. So where do I see the region Highlands and Islands being in in 2030? Well, I absolutely expect there to be orbital flights from multiple spaceports across the region, uh, Shetland, West Niles, uh, Makrohanish and uh, Sutherland have all got opportunities. And by then I would expect several of those to have progressed. 
Uh, I'd expect there to be manufacturing capability in uh, low Earth orbits from Orbex and potentially others in the region. And I would expect the academic sector to be getting really interested in what's happening with the, the whole supply chain. And all of this will bring a whole range of support uh, across the sector and across other sectors coming into there, really developing a knowledge economy for space in the highlands and islands. Um, we've seen that happen on a global basis with rocket labs in New Zealand, and that is probably the most similar comparable to, to Space Up Sutherland in terms of, of launch uh, capacity and capability. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is going to be a an area where the Highlands Islands is genuinely a space region. Uh, and I've worked in economic economic development for over, over well, approaching 20 years. And um, one of the challenges we have in uh, bringing in companies to the region or helping other companies already in the region grow is uh, is people, uh, the lack of people and uh, that you know, this you know, space can't go everywhere. Launch can't go everywhere. There are limited places in the whole of Europe where you could build a successful spaceport and Scotland just ha happens to have several of them. Um, so Scotland as part of the UK has a significant opportunity in space and I can certainly see uh, the Highlands and Island Islands being a centre of space for Scotland and the UK. And I'll stop there and uh, happy to take. Well, Howard, do you want to any? You want to come back to me? Thank you very much, David. Uh, excellent uh, presentation and, and great progress. I think not only uh, at Sutherland but also hopefully in the other uh, regions in the north of Scotland. Um, I think I'll work through the, the uh, questions which I have in front of me. The first one comes from Stu Walker. Um, he's saying that space junk is a huge, huge problem that's only going to get worse. The idea of being a green spaceport is fantastic, but the space industry needs to start thinking about taxing launches so that a strategy for cleaning up low Earth orbit and medium Earth orbit can be carried out. Has HIE considered them the impact of further contributing to space junk and how might uh, it might be able to help in cleaning space up? Maybe I could start off by answering that question, David. <laughs> um, we're talking of 12 launches per year from uh, Sutherland and uh, we're talking of potentially between one and five spacecraft per launch, I think, something like this. Um, and therefore, I don't think that my personal view is that um, Sutherland is not going to contribute to the, the risks of debris like other uh, uh, launches are, are going to do. For example, all of the constellations, low Earth orbit constellations being put in place today by uh, OneWeb and uh, SpaceX and so forth, they, they're, they're going to be 20,000 or more spacecraft in low Earth orbit in the future. So. Um, in, in that sense, for me, uh, space junk is a, is a problem, space debris we call it, um, and there are um, responsibilities and, and uh, discussions going on, particularly in the UK. The UK, UK is taking a, a very strong line on this with the United Nations. And, um, but in fact, I don't think it's that space industry needs to ta be taxing the launches. I think the government needs to put in place the right measures and, and make those who are putting spacecraft into orbit and those who own spacecraft responsible for recovering the debris in the end. And as you say, Orbex is, is a very clean vehicle and also they are going to reuse parts of their launcher. So already this is on the right track to reduce the debris. I don't know what you want to add to that. I, I'd agree with you, Howard. I'd also say that um, the bigger the satellite, the more chances of um, debris, space debris, space junk, whatever you want to call it, you have. Uh, the smaller the satellite, the more likely it is to burn up on re-entry. Uh, and you know, satellites don't go up there and stay there for 40 years. They, they have a they have a life cycle and uh, they will uh, disintegrate and come back down down to Earth. So um, actually, smaller satellites are much better than bigger satellites. Uh, so uh, it I 
I, I take Stu's, Stu's point that it, it is a problem. I totally agree with that. But I think I don't think the launching of small satellites is going to give as big a challenge as launching lots and lots more of big satellites. And uh, as I say, we're a bespoke, unique spaceport, not aiming to be uh, one of the world's biggest spaceports. Right. Thank you, David. And um, in underlining that is that everyone has to be responsible for what what they put into into orbit. And I think this is the, the biggest challenge for everyone. Um, moving on to the next question, it's from uh, also from Stu Walker. Having seen lots of launches at KSC, I presume you mean um, Kourou Space Center. I'm not quite sure whether you mean Kourou or anywhere else. Uh, the roads get jam-packed with spotters going to watch them. Have Highlands and Islands made allowance for parking areas for space tourists who come to watch the launches, including camper caravan spaces, etc. Okay. Question. Yep, absolutely. Again, thanks to you for the question. Um, I think there's two parts to this. Um, I think anybody who's been on the North Coast 500 over the last two summers has seen lots of visitors anyway uh, and you know the, the need for camper sites, caravan spaces, toilet facilities, all of those sorts of basic tourism infrastructure is well understood and I know that the, the Highland Council are working on plans to try and improve all of that. So um, the, the North Coast 500 has been a, a great example of almost viral marketing in an opportunity. That road's always been there nobody ever called it the North Coast 500 until a few years ago and now we've seen huge huge numbers of visitors coming there which is which is useful and beneficial and we were very happy with that. In terms of um, vis tourists from space tourists if you want to call it that, um, we as a part of our planning conditions we we have to develop a visitor management plan which we are in the midst of doing and that will uh, that will detail how we will manage visitors to the site and that's something that is currently being worked on. Um, I I don't anticipate that in itself uh, that uh, the spaceport will have a huge impact in terms of additional visitors coming to there and we, we're doing some work with um, academic tourism experts to to try and help us with that. So I don't it's it's an issue we're aware of but I don't see us needing to uh, build huge massive visitor infrastructure just because of the spaceport. Thank you David. Um, I, when I went to uh, Cape Canaveral when I was working on space uh, space flight a long time ago on space shuttle I was we were about five miles from the launch site so uh, you could see the space shuttle rising up in front of you but you, it took a long time before this noise came and in, in a sense I think this is the idea for um, Sutherland to have people at a, a certain distance away from where the launch site is actually. That's my personal view. Um, we have a question from Ian Moore. I um, wanted to ask how big a job there is for updating the transport links to the spaceport site. Uh, uh, assuming the road network will require some expansion to accommodate the transport of uh, launch vehicles to the site. And also, will Space Hub Sutherland offer any other services such as trajectory planning? Interesting question. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, in terms of the transport uh, itself, um, there are certain conditions in our planning that we need to satisfy. There's some of those uh, expansions of uh, passing places, particularly on the, the road around uh, the spaceport. Um, the reality is that um, Orbex's launch vehicle it can basically, simple terms, uh, Obex's chief exec would, would kill me for saying this, but um, it goes on the back of a lorry. Uh, so what, it's one lorry, so you, it's not exactly a huge amount of additional transport days if you're thinking about, now we're only talking about maximum of 12 launches per annum in the future. Uh, that's, you know, that's only a dozen, maybe a few more in terms of up and down, but it's not a huge amount of additional traffic journey, so we don't uh, anticipate any significant upgrades to the roads being required. In terms of other services, I think that's something that we're looking at at the moment is exactly what 
what the uh, what else is needed in terms of the the site uh, and that's something that the launch site operator will will be looking at when we when we appoint that particular organization thank you david in fact there are two subsequent questions related the same sort of thing uh, joe lightfoot has asked any plans to engage with places like RAF Lossy Mouth to share ideas and experience, especially in mission planning, engineering and, and green. And then Alex Wood, similar question. How much discussion have you had with other space ports specifically about green issues? Let's, if we go back to uh, the mission planning side engineering first, are you in discussions with other uh, other organisations? We've not discussed any detailed discussions with RAF Lysimo, but I'm well aware of the additional capacity uh, and the the um, technology centre that's being planned for RAF Lossie Mouth. Um, one of my colleagues in uh, our area office in, in Murray is uh, heavily involved in that. So no specific conversations with RAF Lossie Mouth, but you know, one of the great advantages of um, of Murray in particular, as opposed to Sutherland necessarily, is that there is a huge knowledge and wealth of aerospace experience in the area going back from decades of uh, RAF involvement in the region. So uh, it's something we'll probably come back to, uh, Joe, uh, and if, uh, I'm not quite sure who the uh, station commander is at RAF Lossy Mouth at the moment. So if anybody wants to just drop me the email of the, of the, the right person, I'm sure when we need to have conversations, we will do. Uh, in terms of uh, green issues on other spaceports, um, I think everybody's thinking about it and the spaceports are working collaboratively. Um, I've not got details today of exactly what the other spaceports are, are considering, but the, um, the spaceports themselves uh, work, uh, consider themselves as working collaboratively, not competitively. Uh, there is a space race, but it's a space space for for the UK against Europe. So there are other spaceports being developed in, uh, for example, Andorra in Norway and the Azores for Portugal. Uh, and uh, the competition for for space and developing space ports is really against Europe. And there's very much a, a strong cohesiveness amongst the uh, the individual spaceports in the UK. That's very good to hear because uh, another aspect of one of the, que the question about uh, mission planning and so forth, um, um, each spaceport will need the same sort of uh, facilities, meteorology, uh, tracking systems to track the launch vehicle and all this stuff. And so uh, perhaps it's worth looking at a common set of infrastructure to support all spaceports. So perhaps I don't know whether this is on your list of things, David. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's an element of we don't need to build things three or four times. So uh, there's certainly the potential for certain things could be shared around that. But I think I think each spaceport at the moment is very much focused on the core infrastructure that they need and getting that developed. Because without, uh, in simple terms, the buildings in the launch pad, the rest is sort of academic at this point. So we're working. Uh, very keen to have conversations with other spaceports and I certainly speak to to Shetland uh, Saxavard spaceport every few weeks. Very good. Um, little note from Stu Walker confirmed by somebody called Richard that KSC is in fact Kennedy Space Centre. So that's right. um, a question from Alex Wood. Interesting question. What impact would Scottish independence have on Space Hub Sutherland? Um, I'm not going to get into an independence debate. Uh, that's not the, the purpose of today's uh, call. But what I'm confident of is that the UK government sees space as a big opportunity. The Scottish government sees space as a big opportunity. Whether Scotland becomes independent or not, I don't see that changing. Uh, so I, I would, it's almost a moot point in terms of uh, of uh, Sutherland and actually space in general. Um, certainly there may be need to be individual different structures and if Scotland did become independent, but are Scotland and the UK aligned in terms of seeing space as a growth sector for the for the for the country? 
of a country you've got you're thinking of when you've got that when you say when you say that phrase absolutely so i don't see that as a a really big challenge very good um, there's one observation from somebody called francis gunn living in tong six miles from space uh, space up by sutherland launch and uh, this person is looking forward to the socio-economic benefits space is very exciting and attractive to young people looking for career opportunities so there you have a uh, somebody who's willing to join the space yep. community. Absolutely, and Francis is absolutely uh, right in that that point. Uh, Francis is a local, might be able to keep me right on the number of pupils at the local high school, but I think it's around 70, and that's a high school, that's not a primary school. So, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, a dozen or so pupils per year in high school. So keeping even a proportion of those locally is uh, really important uh, and you know Sutherland Space of Sutherland Saks Award Spaceport they aren't going to create hundreds of jobs at their particular site but they are going to create dozens of jobs uh, we anticipate around 40 for Space of Sutherland at Saks Award is broadly the same sort of numbers uh, Spaceport one in the West Isles is broadly the, space, the same sort of number and those jobs you don't need to be a rocket scientist to have them all. There's a huge variety of jobs. There's engineering jobs, there's uh, security jobs, there's general office and admin jobs, uh, there's technical jobs. Uh, there really are folk jobs that anybody can can really move forward with. Very good, David. In fact, you know, perhaps one day uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society to, could come up there and talk to the schools and the young people to say, OK, this is what space is about and to interest people to get into the space domain, which is what the society does elsewhere around the country and around the world. Uh, there's a comment from Cameron McGregor. Um, Hi, Liz and Alex, uh, sorry, HIE have been uh, Comment, commended on their thoroughness of preparation and completion of planning material during a judicial judicial review. Very impressive. Um, so the question is, what has has been the biggest challenge to deal with in getting the enterprise to the state it is at the present? Um, really good question, Cameron. I think there's been lots of challenges uh, on the project. I think the first thing is you just stick the word space in something and everybody gets really excited about it and they have opinions for or against and actually in some ways this is an infrastructure project um, we're building um, two buildings a launch pad and a strip of land a strip of road be between them uh, and it's bringing that back to remembering that that this is not rocket science it's rocket science in terms of what we're trying to do uh, it's it's an economic development project as much as it's a, a space project and I think um, I think the the biggest challenge is, is been moving forward with everything. We uh, we have moved forward for the first spaceport to get planning permission. Um, we look forward to to working uh, and move, moving forward quite quickly. Now we've got the judicial review out of the way. Um, it, it has been uh, a challenging project and will continue to be a challenging project. But you're creating something that's never been done in in the UK before. So whether it's it's uh, Sutherland, Shetland or the West Niles, everybody's learning. And I think that is the biggest challenge of it. You can't go to the here's how to build a spaceport in the UK manual because there isn't one. We're all writing it as we as we go forward with this. Very good, David. Uh, we have one comment from Joe Lightfoot. He's saying, David, I'm currently at RAF Lossiemouth, so if you would like to discuss any cooperation in the future, please get in touch. Um, or we can give you the details yep, after. Joe's already meant, uh, LinkedIn invite connected with me, so uh, happy to do that, Joe. Very good. Well, that's, I think we've come to the end of the questions there, David. Um, for me, it's the Space Hub Sutherland is an extraordinary project. It seems to be working extremely well and now with your new responsibilities for all of the space uh, ports in the north of Scotland, this is a very big challenge for you, but uh, we wish you the best of luck for this. Excuse me. And um, I think as we move to the end of this event, uh, all I have to say is that uh, the next lecture is going to take place on the 14th of October. It's by Professor Andrew Ray. Um, 
whom I know very well, Professor of Engineering and Chief Engineer of the University of Highlands and Islands. And uh, you can find out, if you look on the website of the Aero Society, you can find out uh, the details on the events calendar. Um, again, once again, David, thank you very much for this, uh, taking the time to present. It's, uh, we wish you all the very best going forward. Thank you, Howard. Um, and uh, thank you to the Highlands branch for uh, hosting David and for allowing me to come and contribute to this. I've very much enjoyed it. And I hope to be able to come up and see you all there one day, one, <laughs> once I can get out of uh, travel in, from France, come up to Scotland. I have been up to, uh, to see the Orbex factory when they opened it, um, but I would really like to come up and see you all up there again one day soon. So I think having said that, we can close the evening and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you.